Very good evening. It's just gone eight o'clock on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. Welcome to Cross Question. It's the first one of the week. Let me introduce my panel to you. It's Bim Afalami, Conservative MP for Hitchin and Harpenton. Gabby Hinsley, former political editor of The Observer, journalist and writer. Zach Polanski, Green Party member of the Greater London Assembly. He was elected uh, only in May. And Robert Colville, director of the Centre for Policy Studies and Sunday Times columnist. So they're here to answer your questions. The number to call 03 Four five six zero six zero nine seven three, and you can watch our proceedings as well as to listening to us. If you're listening on Global Player, Player, just click the little box at the top of your screen, and you can watch us as well. Or you can watch us on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk, the LBC YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter feeds. Call oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Tweet at LBC. Text eight four eight five zero. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first question. It's from Adam in Bolton. Um, Adam, go ahead. What would you like to ask? Hi, good evening, Ian, and good evening, panel. Um, my question is pretty straightforward. For the last few weeks and months, we've been told by this government that they're following the data and not the dates. How is it that the changing of a health secretary has brought the government to the decision that now the data doesn't matter and we are going to relax and open on the 19th of July. How does that happen? Gabby Hinsliff. I have to say I was a bit surprised when the first thing Sajid Javid said pretty much after arriving in the job, having been there for about five minutes, was that July 19th was definitely going to go ahead. Not only because it feels like a, a hostage to fortune, you know, we've had those promises before and they haven't made it, but... But at the same time, I want to feel really that the health secretary is taking time to weigh the evidence. We're three weeks away from that unlocking. Lots could change, a lot of data to look at between then and now. We need to feel that this is a good, the decision that's being taken, you know, on the evidence. And that's something that he seems to have chucked out of the window on day one. So we'll see if that remains the position, perhaps when he's got his feet under the table a bit more. But it does seem as if government is very determined to send a signal now that they will go ahead, come what may, on the 19th. Um, Bim, I don't know if you were there for the statement that Sajid Javid made this afternoon, but it was a very different tone to Matt Hancock, wasn't it? Inter Matt Hancock always seemed to be uh, very uh, reserved and very cautious about opening things up, and there were obviously conflicts with the Chancellor over that. Well, I wonder whether, because Sajid Javid is a former Chancellor, he's, he almost errs on that side of the argument, and, and he hasn't really read himself into the job yet. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that... I didn't see the statement in the House, though I have seen clips from it. From what I was able to, to see and pick up, it appears to me that what I think the new health secretary, Sajid Javid, is doing is he is taking what you might describe as a whole societal approach. He isn't just saying the only thing that matters is what, from a, what you might describe as a very narrowly health perspective, is the is the the only thing i think he's trying to take a broader approach than what i think many people felt was the previous health secretary's approach which i think a lot of people felt as you said was perhaps in some ways overly cautious and overly focused on on one particular metric so, whereas so there were lots which, of which others. side of this debate do you fall down on well personally i think that it is very very important that once we've vaccinated the the vulnerable and which we, we are which we have and we continue to vaccinate all adults, and I think that the jury is out around children. I think we'd have to look at the, the detailed sort of evidence for that. I think it's very important that we, we open up society as long as that does not lead to mass hospitalizations, which the data is showing us is not the case. The, the number of cases in and of itself is not of critical importance if those cases are not turning into serious illnesses or hospitalizations. And so far, that is not happening. And I think that we've seen quite a lot of evidence now, not just in the UK, but in other countries where their vaccination programs programs have done very well, like ours has, Israel is one example, but not the only one, that we can open up safely because we are going to have to learn to live with this virus in an endemic way uh, over time. But given the, the quite high rise in, uh, in the number of cases at the moment, isn't it rather irresponsible for a new Secretary of State to come in and just say, well, we're going to open up come what may? Um, as, as, the quest, as Adam says, it goes completely against the government stance before now, where it's sort of data, not dates, that drive things? Well, we have quite a lot of data already. I think that's important. I mean, we, we have seen a lot of data about 
what the impact is on people who are vaccinated uh, and people who are not vaccinated when they get this disease. And we know what that is. Uh, and so we've already got a lot of evidence. And I don't think the Health Secretary has, has confirmed it yet. We have not got this 100% confirmed. The Prime Minister has not made that final decision yet, as far as I'm aware. And so... There is still some time to go, but I don't think it's wrong on the basis of what we've seen over several weeks and months to have a good sense about where we think things are going to be come 19th of July. Uh, Zach Polanski. Uh, so the caller's question is a really good one, but essentially it's asking for coherence, logic and humanity from a government that have demonstrated their incoherence, their illogicalness and their absolute lack of humanity. Uh, this whole thing has been an absolute disaster, whether it's been the hundreds of thousands of people's dead, whether it's been the dodgy, dodgy uh, PPE co uh, contracts, or the fact that Matt Hancock was given the dignity of being able to resign and not be sacked. There's nothing to say that a new Secretary of State is going to have a new attitude. All we've seen from this government... Well, is, he clearly is does, though. I mean, you look at his words today, he clearly does have a different attitude. Well, I think it was a different attitude that's much more in line with Boris Johnson. I think now Dominic Cummings has gone, he'll be very happy to have him there. But it's clear, we need to favour health and not wealth. We can't just, you know, go opening things. I'd love to be on this show and give some good news. I'd love to be out there with my mates and going out clubbing and ready for the world to open up. But we need to show an abundance of You're far of too old for that, Zach. <laughs> far too old. <laughs> well, thanks, Ian. Um, but as, <laughs> <laughs> charming as ever. But ultimately, I absolutely think we need abundance of caution. I don't know why you would come on your first day and pretend that this hasn't been a disaster. Show some contrition, some caution, and reassure people. I don't feel reassured by this statement, and I think many people watching will also be very worried about the weeks ahead. Robert Colville, what will you be writing about this in the Sunday Times next week? <laughs> well, I think, um, I mean, to, to get back to Alan's point, um, it's not it's not that um, Sajid Javid has come in and and you turned on on the policy. I um, mean, you, know, you know, this is an important decision which is made by the Prime Minister, the Chancellor, the Health Secretary, um, and Michael Gove at, at the Cabinet Office. They're, those they're the kind of quad who have made these decisions with with the input of a sort of a panoply of, of scientific experts. When Boris Johnson put back reopening in June, it wasn't because it was un safe to reopen. It was because we didn't have enough data yet. And they said, you know, they, we didn't have enough data about how the Delta variant, um, formerly called the Indian variant, was going to be, was going to uh, affect people. And in particular, whether we had broken the link between cases and deaths. I, I think what we're seeing now is not so much Sajid Javid coming in and, sort of, and ripping up the old policy, although he is obviously per someone who's, you know, quite instinctively um, pro, uh, pro pro openness as, as been said as a former chancellor he he has the economic stuff in mind but I think what we're seeing now is is, is a, a sense within government and you saw it within the prime minister's own remarks as well that you know the data seems to be showing that we that um, that the, the, that link has been broken that um, you know the, there are more cases happening but there are not so far more deaths and there, and there are not the things happening which are going to lead to more deaths later on obviously we all have to cross our fingers and hope but I, I, I think that's what we're seeing now that you know, it's it's not just this statement from from Javid today. There's been a few a, a sort of drumbeat for a few days that actually we're not, um, you know, that that things are looking uh, good on that front. But the problem is that it's marching the troops up to the top of the hill, and then what they what they can't have happen surely is a repeat of what when was it June the nineteenth or twenty first? I can't remember when we were all marched up to the top of the hill and then marched down again. That would be a political disaster for the prime minister, surely, and um, and for all of us as, well, as human beings. Um, but but. I mean, before that last decision, you you saw a drumbeat of you know scientists were coming out and saying, well, actually, it's too you know it's too too oh it's not not looking great. You know, is it? Oh, I'm not really sure about this. Whereas no, there's none. There doesn't seem to be any of that happening. You know, it wasn't as if it was a thunderbolt from the blue. It was when Boris made the delay announcement. It was everyone went, yeah, fair enough. You know, we can kind of accept the case for that. Um, Bim, are you worried about that? I, tell tell us what your constituents are saying to you, because I imagine there will be um, most of them have been very compliant with the regulations yeah. so far and there has been general public consent that you, you obey the rules with, with in the hope that they will be lifted as soon as possible but do you think we're getting to that point now where if the rules aren't lifted on july the 19th that public consent is going to evaporate i think there's a there's a risk of that yes um if I think what constituents are saying to me, and not so much in emails, I mean, look, emails are important. Uh, all constituents listening, you can send me emails. Emails matter. But I get it from picking up, from speaking to people, getting, getting around about, and what people say to me. And what people have been saying to me is, look, you know, we've put up with this, but you guys better make sure this is going to be all right come the 19th you know, July. Because... 
when the last period we were marched to the top of the hill and we came down again, you know, I did get some angry feedback and people were saying, look, you know, wh what's it going to take? We vaccinated this group, we vaccinated that group. What, what more do we have to do? Um, and so I think there will be a lot of concern. I think that also we just have to, and I think the government and members of parliament like me have to do a better job of communicating what the future looks like with this virus. Because at the moment, what we've been saying over the last year is, look, this is very scary, stay at home and be very, very careful. And if we're going to release, if not completely all, the vast, vast majority of restrictions, we're going to have to change how we communicate with people. Uh, uh, and Zach, when you look at the, the effect of this on London, and I mean, let's talk about the nightlife. Um, you, you mentioned clubbing, but you, you look at theatres, you look at live music venues... Um, I mean, they are not being opened up in the same way that some sporting events are. And people people see inconsistencies here. When you when you observe inconsistencies, you think there is a certain unfairness to it. And I suspect that there'll be a lot of people, not just um, people who go out uh, of an evening, but the people that run these establishments who are tearing their hair out. Yeah, I think there's been a massive inconsistency, whether it's between theatres and music halls and sport, and we saw what happened at Ascot. There seems to be one rule for one group and another rule for another. And within that, I'm so worried about these people with these precarious jobs. Before I was in politics, I was an actor, so I know so many actors and musicians who are struggling right now. And when Rishi Sunak had the perfect opportunity to provide a universal basic income, he essentially um, missed the opportunity completely. And he's been absolutely missing, you know, um, in action for the past few months we've not heard anything from him i think ultimately when you look at um for instance after the second world war the government responded to a crisis by setting up the nhs we really needed to respond to this crisis with a new equitable way of looking at wealth and how we deal with social security and this government once again completely missed that opportunity so i think we really need to give theaters and musicians that focus um uh, financial support, but also make sure that when things do open and go up again, we're, we're really supporting them. Um, credit to Andrew Lloyd Webber, I suppose, that the Prime Minister seemed to want to almost bribe him when he gave that statement and said, you know, we'll look at pilots and Andrew Lloyd Webber refused and he seemed to find another way to get things open. But it can't be one rule for Tory donors and one rule for all the small independent arts venues. We need to treat everyone equally. Um, Gabby Hinsliff, you, you've been covering this pandemic all, all the way through. Do you think we are at a point now where the public are going to start to be less forgiving for any decisions that they don't approve of? Yeah, I think there's been huge caution and, and huge willingness to um, to follow guidance, you know, and it surprised everybody how obedient we've, we've all been willing to be. Um, but I think there comes a point where the elastic snaps and I don't think it necessarily manifests itself in sort of mass disobedience, but just in people, you know, people's willingness to do this stuff flagging and and the more people see you know the t thing I've heard more and more over the last week is you know I can't go to my kids school sports day but however many thousand fans can cram into Wembley or you know mm. I can't have a wedding with more than 30 people but apparently it's fine for Ascot to go ahead or whatever it is you know people are beginning to feel that that's un fair and they are also I think I wondered whether part of the reason that, that Sasha Javid said what he did this week was um, there was some suggestion that in the Cheshire and Amersham by-election uh, there was feedback that that people didn't you know were annoyed that that the restrictions hadn't been lifted in June 21st and that made them less likely to uh, less enthusiastic about coming out and voting Tory I wonder if part of what we're seeing this week is a signal being sent ahead of the Batley and Spen by-election that you know we've got it all under control it really is happening you can trust us this time because I think what people found so difficult Difficult last time, particularly businesses, was that the decision came at the last minute not to go ahead with opening on June the 19th. And you had literally, you know, nightclub owners stocking their bars thinking we're going to be open on yeah. on Monday and not knowing right until the last minute that it wasn't happening. Your plans being thrown up in the air like that. I don't think people can take another one of those. Should just clarify, you can have more than 30 people at a yeah. wedding, you just can't dance or oh, yeah, sing sorry, or do, do, do anything dance. enjoyable. <laughs> um, Adam not a in wedding Bolton. if you can't dance, I don't count. Well, exactly. Bit of dancing around your handbag to Dancing Queen. I'm sure, Robert, you love to do that. Um, Adam in Bolton, what would you like to say to what you've heard? I mean, my my basic point at the moment is that uh, I think the, the country is tired of hearing Boris Johnson and his government set the country up time and time again for a fall. Um, the rules that he made and the changes he made at Christmas saying you can, you know, Christmas is coming, you can have the five days, and then he changed his mind at the last minute people's hopes and 
dreams were dashed then then the fiasco in june where he was saying yes 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 this is going to be our freedom day and then people were raised again as you said to the hill and then he dashed their hopes again and now we've got sajid javid coming in and saying well everything that you heard from our previous health secretary you can forget about because i'm going to change the rules overnight and that to me just seems like it reaffirms my feeling that not only does boris johnson really not know what he's doing but even his minions at the highest level at the front benches don't know what they're doing. And I personally think it's time this government was gone. And I think there really needs to be a change from the Conservative Party to another party. And I'm not sure that Labour are there yet, because I don't see much coming from Keir Starmer either. But we definitely need some politicians in this country now who can actually set the tone, know what they're talking about, do their homework and actually get our country back on track. Okay. Adam, thank you very much indeed. Uh, James, on a text, has a different perspective. He says they all need a good slap. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call if you'd like to ask our panel a question. It's 16 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. With Purple Bricks, book your free in-home or virtual valuation. It's 20 past eight. Bim Afalami, Conservative MP, Gabby Hinsliff, journalist and writer, Zach Polanski, Green Party member of the GLA, and Robert Colville, director of the Centre for Policy Studies and Sunday Times columnist with me, taking your questions. 0345 6060 973. Um, I'm going to take a, a question and then a text question both together here because they kind of relate to the same thing. Let's go to Luke in Bromley. Hello, Luke. Ian, good evening and good evening, panel. Hello. Hi. Right, my question is, 
on the basis of the discovery of the amount of corruption going on with Hancock's contracts, should, is it about time perhaps all the contracts that he signed as health minister should be re-looked at, revisited and perhaps retendered? And Colin in Sheffield texts, we all pay ministers to serve us honestly and openly. Why are they so scared of having cameras in their offices? Well, <laughs> I think you can see why Matt Hancock was, but um, uh, let's go to Robert Colville first. Well, Colin's uh, question reminds me of this uh, this this sci-fi book I read. Um, not well, not very not very sci-fi, uh, but um, in which um, essentially, yeah, essentially a, a politician volunteers to be the first to basically wear a body camera that everything <laughs> they do will be will be clear and in the open, and they will be accountable Madness. to the people. And and the movement sweep, sweeps uh, sweeps Washington, uh, and then you know, so so everyone basically everything you have this sort of doctrine of radical transparency, which I I I, I think would be. Um, Quite a lot of our politicians would 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 not like. Um, I think um, the point about con- uh, about um, contracts is, is a really good one, good one. I mean, I I think we have to accept sort of two different things here. The first is that you know during the pandemic, during the early stages, there was a lot of stuff. You know, there was a lot of desperation. Like everyone in the world was trying to buy the same PPE equipment. I mean, some of the stuff Dominic Cummings has talked about sending emails, just saying like you know sod the laws, sod the judicial review stuff, just. Just get the thing. Just get get it on planes. You know that I think that there, there was that kind of spirit of, of urgency, and some of that may not look as look as good if you rewind it. Um, the, the, some of the stuff about giving contracts to your landlord, uh, to your local pub landlord, might look 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 as good um, if you rewind it. But I, I think generally, it's just like government procurement is like it's an insanely boring phrase even 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 just the word procurement makes you fall asleep but government is spending billions and billions and billions of pounds every year and generally it's spending it really badly um cuz i'm a nerdy policy wonk kind of guy i read a i reviewed a book recently on called bad buying which is just about how bad we are or how bad organizations are at buying stuff and the british government and the british state crop up again and again and again and again so i think this is an area that that needs huge reform i'd really like to see you know everything go out onto onto a website where everyone could bid for it. I'd love to see British small businesses. Didn't David being on Cameron equal. introduce that? I'm sure they, I remember they, that. They, they, the Camerons, they they tried to sort of break the monopoly of the, the few big suppliers, but it, it 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 didn't really work. I mean, there's there's other countries which do this so much better than ours and save so much money. Um, Zach Polanski, let's go to you on this. Do you think that it would be a good idea for all of these contracts now to be published, reassessed? Um, undoubtedly, we absolutely need more transparency. And this is often dismissed as, you know, a democracy or um, sometimes it's, you know, called cronyism. And it's not calling it what it is. It's absolute corruption. And Matt Hancock has history on this. When he was Secretary of State for Climate Change in 2015, he took £18,000 from he, the he, Global hang Warming on, hang Policy on. He, Foundation. He, 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 he was never Secretary of State for Climate Change. Uh, sorry, for Energy and Climate in 2015. No, no, no. He, he was never in that, de- certainly not Secretary of State, and I don't think he was in that department. It's one of those awkward moments where I want Google in front of me. <laughs> but essentially, I'll make another point rather than argue with Ian Dale on LBC, because I suspect that you might know what you're Well, I'm, not go- I'm now going to look him up, but I'm pretty sure I'm oh, right I'm going to have this. the best moment if I'm right, and I'm going to go out clubbing to celebrate. As he soon as he was a business and enterprise minister, my producer, Robbie. And, and, and I, I think from memory, from, from memory, he took money from someone who was involved in this foundation. He didn't take money from that particular foundation. Okay, okay there we go. Um, but essentially... This is looking at who who receives the money. Now, whether Matt Hancock took that money or someone else, we know for a fact that ministers and MPs frequently take uh, donations during political campaigns from think tanks and from groups that have nefarious purposes. Sometimes they have good purposes. But think ultimately, tanks do not donate to... I, I, I run a think tank. Think tanks don't donate to government. Well, as you'll know, Robert... Don't, 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 donate, don't donate to politicians. It's just literally not what they do. Hold on there, Robert. The think tank might not, but people involved with the think tank certainly find routes <sighs> to do it. And we know that money is all involved in politics. Now, this is essentially about transparency and accountability, and it's about making sure that every single local representative of that constituency is answerable to their constituency, and they know exactly where that money is coming from and what it's being spent on. And ultimately, we need to look at every single one of those contracts to make sure there isn't a revolving door, and also that when ministers leave the government, they don't go and work for the companies that they've just made decisions on. I mean, this is clearly common sense, and it just wouldn't happen in any other business, yet it seems to be rife throughout our British government. Um, have you got a camera in your office that you know of? <laughs> Not that I know of, but you'd be very welcome. I mean, it'd be very boring. It'd be me on my laptop, mainly. Um, we're going to have a score draw on, on our little conflict there because he was Minister of State for Energy, but he wasn't Secretary of State. So we'll, I'm going to we'll take that, that as a win. Shall we call that 1-1? Well, I'll say 2-1, <laughs> you know, just like England. I just beat Germany. <laughs> All right. Uh, Gabby Hinsliff. 
I just want to know if he had a camera in his office when he was Minister for Energy slash Climate Change. But anyway, um, I, th I think there is sort of two things you have to separate out here. One is what Robert was talking about, which is the I think people understand that in a pandemic, in a national crisis, you know, you may sometimes cut through the red tape and you may sometimes take shortcuts that you wouldn't take otherwise and it's it's you know not necessarily a bad thing to have done that but again it's also not necessarily a bad thing that the system can then go back afterwards crawl over those contracts retrospectively including seeing them challenged in the courts as we have recently and decide whether or not it was justifiable to break the rules but i think there is there's a difference between that kind of emergency commissioning in a pandemic and what you've seen too often from this government which is just a kind of slapdash the rules don't apply to us we can do what we like you know we've seen it again this week with the revelation of how many ministers matt hancock included uh, corresponding by private email accounts you know using the sense of government being conducted by whatsapp and dominic Cummings sending angry texts to the prime minister at midnight you know these are these are very casual ways of doing business. And while it sounds a bit almost prim and proper to set, stand here and say, why didn't you send it via your government email account? You know, there's a reason to this. It's not only the fact that government comms have to be secure. It's that eventually at the end of this, there's going to be a public inquiry and you want mm. all that information to be discoverable. You want to know exactly how and go back line through line how decisions were taken and at the end of the day all this boring nerdy sort of slightly prim sounding process stuff really really matters it's about how public money is spent and decisions are taken in the public interest uh, and the, the the whole point about the cameras, um, the, the, Colin says, why are they so scared of having cameras in their offices? Well, I don't, I can't think of anybody that I know that has a camera in their office recording their every move. I'm not sure I'd want one. I've got a camera. I'm well, well, you literally have a camera in your office. <laughs> in. Yeah. Well, I do. I have lots of cameras in this studio. You're absolutely right, but I'm, I'm not sure that it really. Uh, anyway, um, Bim. Well, just on cameras, I mean, if we want to live in that sort of world, we can, but that appears, that, that doesn't appear to me be, to be the sort of world that most of us want to live in, where you've got cameras monitoring our every move 24-7 for everyone. But I think the broader point, the more serious point around contracts, I think it's very, very important. When I first got to Parliament, I sat on something called the Public Accounts Committee that works very closely with the National Audit Office. Uh, and I'm willing to say on record, these are some of the most able, dedicated civil servants that I've, ed I've had privilege to know. And these are people who really have looked at the procurement in relation to these health contracts and what they've come to the conclusion a national audit office doesn't answer to government you know they can say what they like and they've been very critical of government and many times in the past what they've come to the conclusion of is that though some contracts in hindsight appear to have spent too much public money when trying to get very scarce materials such as pp at the height of the pandemic they did not find any instance of impropriety when looking at any of the contracts. So the contracts you're talking about, every single one signed by the Department of Health has been looked at by the National Audit Office. And so I think that's a really important point to put on the record. In relation to the broader point around how government procurement works, I agree with Robert uh, that government procurement has long been a mess in this country. Uh, it is very, very difficult. I think the reasons why in this country we've done it poorly over, over, frankly, a large, a long period of time. First of all, we procure so much from central government compared to lots of other countries. So we're having to do so much centrally that mistakes can get made and you don't always get the right suppliers. Secondly, we have a very small number of very, very big suppliers. David Cameron's government tried to break that down and get smaller suppliers in, but of course smaller suppliers ended up sometimes costing more because they didn't have the same um, efficiencies of scale that the bigger suppliers had. And so that meant that when people were looking afterwards at the contracts, they said, oh, well, why did you go with contract X when it cost you 5% more? It's public money. And actually, the government's answer was, well, we actually wanted to make sure that SMEs could be part of this procurement and they could do a very good service. But then certain other people said, no, 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 you've got to go for the cheapest price always. But if you go for the cheapest price, you don't always get necessarily the best long-term value. So actually, and the weird it's thing is, that if, well. you, if you look at NHS and MOD procurement, they don't often get the cheapest price, even though they have these massive, massive budgets but that's probably yeah. something for another day. Um, very quickly, Luke, what, what's your view on your own question? Ian, what I've learned about business is people do business with you and they like you when they trust you. I believe if politicians in, in introduce integrity, people will like them and trust them. I think it's important to be summed up as integrity. 
Well, that's an interesting point. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take more of your calls in a moment. 0345 6060 973. It's half past eight on LBC. Let's get the news headlines from Zora Suleiman. The new health secretary says that we can and will not wait a moment longer than we need to to lift England's lockdown rules. Sajid Javid has told MPs in his first statement in the job that we need to learn to live with coronavirus and we're on track to ease restrictions on the 19th of July. A cabinet office minister says the camera in Matt Hancock's office, which caught him breaking COVID rules, was an outlier and not meant to be there. Julia Lopez also says that she doesn't believe he was being spied on. And the Ministry of Defence is investigating how secret documents were left behind at a bus stop in Kent. Some were marked UK eyes only and included details of a military deployment. LBC weather showers mostly dying out tonight, but some persisting across southern England, overcome for central England but clear further north and across Scotland and Northern Ireland a low of 9 degrees This is LBC The ex- Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. With Purple Bricks. Meet your local property expert today. It's 8.34. I know a lot of people tune in around this time, so let me reintroduce my panel. Uh, Bim Afalami is Conservative MP for Hitchin and Harpenden. Gabby Hinsliff, journalist and writer. Zach Polanski, Green Party member of the Greater London Assembly. And Robert Colville, director of the Centre for Policy Studies. Um, Zach, you were elected in May. How are you finding it? Is it, in t- is it what you thought it would be like? Um, it's fantastic. I really feel the weight of responsibility of representing so many Londoners, but ultimately every day learning something new, and it's, it's brilliant to represent my community. Uh, and is there a lot of cross-party cooperation on, on the GLA, or is it very, very party political? I, I get the feeling there's a lot of sort of um, what's the word? A, lo- a lot of an- an- animosity between the Conservatives and Labour. But how do you and the Lib Dems fit into that? Well, the London Assembly is one of the unique bodies in British politics that actually we have to work collaboratively. We're not an administration, we're a scrutiny body. So actually we're always working together on various committees. I chair the Environment Committee um, and that's really interesting because obviously it's, it's COP26 this year and there's masses that needs doing. Of course, Conservative and Labour get into their kind of tribal petty politics from time to time. I like to think of the Greens as the adults in the room um, <laughs> that are there, you know, making sensible, coherent policy. Have, but I would have, say that, have, wouldn't I? Have you read your manifesto? I think our manifesto is pretty fantastic. I think if our manifesto had been taken and we had a green mayor of London, uh, London would be the greenest city in the world. 
I asked for that. Right, you did. Fan- fanta- fantastic uh, yeah. does have two meanings, of course. Uh, yeah, that's very true. Let's go to our next questioner to dig me out of this. It's Simon in Wotton Under Edge in Gloucestershire, which sounds very idyllic. Simon, what would you like to ask? Thank you, Ian. I'd like to ask, was silence golden for Keir Starmer before Matt Hancock resigned? And is it now time for the Labour leader to become more vocal? It, Zach, it was slightly odd that we didn't really hear anything from Keir Starmer on this until I think a soundbite on the on the news last night. I mean, slightly odd seems a polite way to de- describe Keir Starmer's I, I'm a leadership. Person. Oh, yeah, well, indeed. So it's all good to be polite, but ultimately, Keir Starmer has been missing uh, in action for for years now, ever since he's been elected. He seems to make decisions slightly afterwards, and when he does make decisions, he always seems to be struggling between this red wall um, kind of discourse and looking back to the label tribal roots and just trying to work out where exactly he stands. And I think it's quite clear that Labour, for a few n- years now, aren't really standing for anything, and this is an obvious point to say that the Green Party did really well in the local elections and that just wasn't from disenchanted Labour voters it was also from Conservative voters too I think the old uh, two party tribal politics people are sick of and actually they're looking for something different and you asked me about the Green Party manifesto but I think it's not just for manifesto but actually the fact the party is rooted in its community and is listening to locals, we're hearing time and time again that people feel like we're representing them I think that's something that Labour has lost I think maybe it was there initially but I think Keir Starmer just seems absolutely Absolutely out of touch with what people in the actual constituencies are thinking and feeling. Bim, now you could come out with the sort of normal party political knockabout stuff, or you couldn't. I don't normally do that. No, you um, don't. That's very true. Uh, I mean, Keir Starmer is a he's a curious fellow in many ways. Everybody, what do people know about him? We know that he's a highly capable lawyer. He's proved that in his career. We know he's actually, in my own personal interactions with him have always been very pleasant. He seems like a genuinely nice person. And frankly, that <laughs> that's not always a given in politics. Um, but I think his core difficulty is that I just don't know really what his politics are. And what I mean by that is not that, I mean, he's broadly left-wing. I think that's that's true and that's been true throughout his life. But I'm not really sure what he really believes what his vision is for Britain and I don't really think he's been able to communicate that. Well to be fair to him there's been a pandemic on it's not something that I mean I never thought we were going to get a whole raft of policies from him until this was all over because frankly no one would take any notice. No I agree but I think actually if you forgive me it's not per se a policy suggestion you could get you'd spend a few weeks working with some very clever people in the Labour Party they could come up with policies it's more that emotional connection that you have with people to show people what you really believe and what you're about. The Prime Minister, I think it's fair to say, is not a sort of walking think tank in terms of policies. But what the Prime Minister does... Is that an understatement? (laughs) What the Prime Minister does incredibly effectively is he gives people a sense of the sort of Britain he wants to he wants to build and what he wants to achieve. And and that vision is what people buy into. And then the policy comes in afterwards. And I think the problem with Keir is he doesn't seem to be able to do that. And that's why both the left and the right of his party, uh, some of them trying to bring back Tony Blair, I keep hearing. I, I think, to be fair, that's Lord Adonis. <laughs> that's true. Um, but, but I think that's why both the left of his party and the right are impatient with Keir. It's not because they don't like him. It's because they can't see what sort of Labour or what sort of Britain he wants. I think that's his core problem. Gabby Hinsliff, you, you've been observing Labour leaders for many, many years. Um, what, what do you Glad make you of Keir Starmer? Glad you say how many years there. No, well, I, I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, um, how, what do you make of his first, what, um, 15 months in, in office? Do you think that, given there's been a pandemic on, could he have cut through any more than he has? I think it's been a a year very much of two halves. You know, if you think back to summer last year when the Tories seemed to be in trouble and, you know, the pandemic was uh, really denting their popularity with the government and Keir Starmer suddenly looked, I mean, okay, slightly low bar here, but compared to Jeremy Corbyn, looked like a sort of triumph of grown-up party management and it was all going very well. And suddenly that ran out of steam. And the second half of the year has just felt floundering really it's felt i think ben's right it's it's felt as if he cannot somehow project to people who and what he is in a way that you know that goes beyond policy i mean the Labour party doesn't as you say doesn't have to have lots of policy at this stage but people feel they know who angela rayner is or what she stands for they feel they know who jess Phillips is or what she stands for they certainly felt they knew who jeremy corbyn or john mcdonnell were and and there is a sort of slipperiness around here that people even people who are close to him find it quite hard to 
pin him down as to as to what he thinks on key issues. And now you get the sense very much, I mean, staying out of commenting on Matt Hancock was one thing. You could say there's an argument that, you know, when your enemy is embarrassing themselves, you just leave them to it. There's no need to get in, involved, particularly when it comes to, it's to do with someone's private life. And he's been very embroiled in this sort of internal reshuffle of um, half the leader of the office's staff leaving in the last week. Um, but it's, it goes bigger than that. It's bigger than Matt Hancock. It's the sense that he's almost frightened to say something because almost whatever he says upsets some half of a very divided, factionalised Labour Party or will play wrong in some part of the country. He's trying to sort of organise disparate groups of Labour voters who are coming from very different places or, or should probably say former Labour voters rather than current Labour voters in some cases. And almost anything he says, almost any side of the fence that he comes down on is going to upset someone. And he hasn't found the overarching big purpose, which allows him to, I mean, Tony Blair was a divisive presence for the Labour Party. He upset, you know, parts of it, you know, on a weekly basis, but he had an overriding purpose that the party felt it could get behind. And it's not clear what that is for Keir Starmer. I know mm. he wants to win, but how, for what purpose, isn't clear. Dean in Swansea has texted to say, if you can't find Keir Starmer, just look for the nearest fence. He will be sitting on that. Uh, cruel, but... Um, Robert Colville, I, I was fine with Keir Starmer. When, when you watch him on things like Piers Morgan's life stories, he comes over as actually a very nice, compelling individual. Um, I did an interview with him some time ago with Jackie Smith for 10 or 15 minutes, and it wasn't really political, and he was very funny, and he, I think he came across brilliantly to people. But when he's doing political interviews, he just can't quite convey it, can he? Yeah, I mean, I've always felt, I mean, this is a slightly a cruel thing to say, but it's kind of like with Ed Miliband, there's, like, Starmer's voice just kind of, just killed, there's, 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 there's something about it which just doesn't kind of, that doesn't cut through. I think, I mean, what we forget with Starmer is he's not been a politician for very long. It's he very went, he was the director of public prosecutions, He and he went uh, from that pretty much straight into, uh, you know, he went he, he, into a safe seat um, in North London. And then... Because he was obviously a very bright, clever guy, and because there weren't, weren't a very large amount of people who were willing to serve under Jeremy Corbyn, um, he got uh, he got he got sort of promoted straight to the front bench, and then he um, and then he comes through, um, you know, in, in, by telling everyone exactly what they want to hear, which is that he'll be Corbyn but w electable um, in the leadership contest. But he hasn't he hasn't like done it. He hasn't had many of those things where something there's some mad story happening, and everyone's and he needs to make a decision, and you know he needs to you know use his judgment. He's not got that kind of got that bank of experience to draw on. So you get this this sense that he is. I mean, as everyone else has said, you get the sense that he's slightly second guessing. Him himself he's sort of waiting to make a comment to work out what will appease the different factions within labor rather than just saying what he actually thinks but that's the same for any political leader because all political parties are effectively coalitions the conservative party is a coalition between the sort of uh, libertarians the one nation people thatcherites the labor party has obviously got its own factions that's just political leadership yeah but you get the sense that it's it's, it's having a slightly paralyzing effect and especially in this second half of the year i mean i think we, in, in terms of the pandemic um it, it, he's been in a a tough place because the, the the polls are really clear the public did not want to see po politics happening in the pandemic they wanted you know politicians to pull together and do what was good for the country and so what but that was kryptonite for the labor supporters mm. for the um who did hate the tories thought the tories were killing people and the the, the, the charge sheet that's that laid out essentially um and you couldn't understand why why the labor party leader was not articulating their criticisms i actually wonder um and i've kind of said this before maybe the missed thing was when the pandemic happened should starmer have made a, a like a big open offer of a of a you know government of national unity like a kind of formal like this crisis transcends politics mm. thing as it was they've been kind of trapped in this sort of semi-supportive semi-oppositional mode which hasn't been really very good for them. Simon, what's your view? Uh, as an occasional Labour voter, I've been incredibly uh, frustrated and disillusioned with Starmer over the past few months. And I was absolutely engrossed by the Matt Hancock story over the weekend. I, I literally followed LBC around the clock, it seems. And I kept sort of almost shouting on my radio, where is Keir? Uh, and all he was doing is sending people out to represent him, just to ironically say, you know, Johnson is is spineless and and needs to you know should should show more and take a more proactive action, um, and uh, you know but actually he could have claimed Hancock's scalp he could have got a victory here and he could have taken him down, and um, what he did was his usual thing to stay silent until after the event, and then you know it's kind of pointless when he spoke yesterday it was too late too little too late. 
And that, that is one of the guiding rules of opposition. Only call for someone to resign when you think they're actually going to. And he, he, you're right, he could have done that there. Simon, thank you very much indeed for your question. Uh, more of your questions to come, 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC's Cross Question. It's 8.45. This is LBC. Excuse- Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. With Purple Bricks, manage viewings anywhere with the app. It's 8.48 on LBC. Cross Question with Bim Afalami, Gabby Hinsliff, Zach Polanski and Robert Colville. A text question from Jean in Portsmouth. When are we going to admit that it's climate change leading to extreme weather events like we're currently seeing in Canada and start taking the issue seriously? Um, Bim. I think we are taking it seriously uh, and that's why we've committed to net zero by 2050. We did that ahead of almost every major industrialised country. That's why we are decarbonising our energy system. That's why we've got the 10-point plan and various other things we're trying to do so that we are going to decarbonise so that we can keep the global warming temperature down so that we don't end up in a cataclysmic situation. We're working globally to do that and that's what COP26 happening in November in Glasgow is all about. And do you do you attribute extreme weather events to climate change or do you think it's more nuanced than that? Uh, it is more nuanced than that. I think that it it is part of a pattern of things that can be probably partly attributed to climate change, but I think it's very dangerous to say that, you know, in areas which have extreme weather and actually go back two, three, four hundred years where they had extreme weather then, all that all the extreme weather that's happening now is all to do with climate change. I think it's a very, very complex picture, which even some of the best scientists haven't fully been able to get on top of. I'm going to ask you to keep your answers relatively brief, then we can fit in more questions before the end. Um, Gabby? Obligatory plug for The Guardian here, my employer, which does take climate change incredibly seriously. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think public attitudes on this have shifted enormously. I think 
there is real appetite now for a government that goes further and faster. Um, but I think it's going to have to be upfront with us about some of the difficult decisions that might involve. You know, it's not going to be painless the next leg of adapting to um, net zero. And I think the sooner we start having some serious conversations about that, which to be fair, have been put off by the pandemic, you know, the better. Robert. Um, I think yeah, I think you think Britain take uh, all parties take uh, climate change seriously, um, uh, especially in contrast to America. Um, and I think you know the, the Conservatives have, have have a pretty good record on it. We've decarbonised more quickly than um, most, than I think almost every other major economy, um, stripping coal out of the economy. Um, that said, I think as Gabby says, the tension we're going to come across is that uh, the vote, the voting public are incredibly willing and eager for us to decarbonise. They are incredibly reluctant to pay any more money in taxes to do so. I think. Um, I, I looked at some polling the other day showing that um, only 9% of Tory voters, 9, 9%, and and only slightly more Labour voters actually, were willing to see their heating bills go up if it meant helping to save save the planet. And the you know the narrative that's been sold um, partly by the government is that um, is that net zero and um, and going green will be a cost free and indeed job creating process. And we are going to have to be a bit more honest about the trade offs to come. Um, Zach, when we look at these uh, extreme weather events, do you attribute them all to climate change or do you agree with BIM that it's not quite as simple as that? No, BIM's right. It is more nuanced than that, although the pattern is certainly there in terms of catastrophic climate uh, emergency. Just two very quick examples, though. You asked me about my first month at the London Assembly. I used my very first question ever to ask Sadiq Khan, the mayor, about citizens' assemblies, and he said, as a politician, I was in danger of making myself redundant. That misses the point entirely about what we need to do in terms of democracy and citizenship. I then used my second time talking to the mayor to ask him about the Silvertown Road Tunnel. For people who don't know, this is a four-lane motorway that the mayor is planning to build Um, In Greenwich and Newham, it's going to cost £2.2 billion during an air pollution crisis and a climate emergency. I asked him when that's had public scrutiny. He said to me, well, I just won an election. Apart from this new road didn't appear even once in his election. It's this complacency towards getting to net zero by 2030, which is leading us on the road to disaster. We need to start taking this seriously, have a Green New Deal and make sure we've got a just transition because there's no environmental justice without social, racial and economic justice too. Do, do you has this government surprised you in any way on its green agenda? Because as as Robert said, it, it has decarbonised more quickly than most. Well, I think virtually every other developed country, and, and indeed their targets for decarbonisation are more stringent than the Green Party in Germany, for example. Um, so none of this is true. Um, essentially, it I reject the, the presupposition of the question. They've not decarbonised. What they've done is they've outsourced their carbon emissions. No, so they've true. stopped including shipping. They've stopped including no. landfill. And essentially, what we're doing is taking it to places. Like like China and India, and pretending that we're perfect. We need to take much bigger action. And what the government are doing now is just talking and not taking action. The G7 was a huge missed opportunity. We can't do that again at COP26. Alok Sharma, as president of COP26, needs to make sure that he's going with a real agenda, that we're doing that democracy piece, that we're involving people, and we're being realistic about what change is going to need to happen. The biggest thing about this, though, if we're going to believe in science fact rather than science fiction, is even if people don't believe in the climate, emergency and they don't believe it's going to be so bad. Ultimately, what we're looking for is cleaner air, better jobs, better local communities. These things are worth doing in and of themselves. And actually, we could have a retrofitting revolution in London and across the UK. Uh, For instance, fuel poverty in London, 130,000 people are living in fuel poverty. If you can't afford to heat your home, is it really an affordable home? These are huge questions and we need to start really looking at the answers, but we need to start from the same page and not pretend with platitudes that we're doing the best in the world because we certainly aren't. So you don't give them any credit at all? Um, I give them very little credit. And in fact, if anything, I think this government have been pretty disastrous on a lot of these things. I think it's almost worse to pretend you're doing something than actually not do anything at all and admit that you don't care about it, rather than saying all the right things, but actually not taking any actions. All that does is make people complacent, assume the government has got it in hand. And meanwhile, things are getting worse and worse. And as we've seen in Canada, we really need to start that 1.5 degree threshold. Otherwise, I mean, I say climate change is on its way. It's happening in other countries already and we're seeing disasters but here in London there's lots of future risks we're seeing subsidence already which is where homes are starting to to fall Uh, the Thames is you know the Thames Barrier was built in 1982 but just within our lifetime the Thames Barrier won't be effective anymore so without sounding like I'm doom mongering because there's loads of things we can do and actually there's huge (laughs) opportunity here for new jobs and a new kind of way of looking at society and actually it's hopeful but we've really got to look at what the problem is and not pretend there isn't one Uh, Jay on a text says China is a thousand times more polluted 
polluting than the UK. Why not bully them into submission instead of us? Uh, let's move on to Tony in Doncaster. Hello, Tony. Hello, Ian. Hi, what would you like to ask? Um, Michael Gove, uh, Pretty Patel, um, Williamson, and now Matt Hancock. Is this government being um, run like something from the Wild West? And that's your question. Well, if you want me to elaborate some more, I can, but the producer says keep it brief. Well, uh, you know, I mean, keep it brief, but I mean, is the government running itself like the Wild West? I'm not sure that's going to elicit much. I mean, yes, it is. Let, let, let's expand. <laughs> let's expand it a little. And I mean, say, is Boris Johnson in danger of losing his authority when he doesn't take action against ministers that um, have clearly done something wrong? Bim, I think that the. Um the difficulty with politics is that when you look back in the past, we all think that the people in the past were these sort of political giants. And we look back and say, oh, why can't the politicians be like X or Y in the past? And the truth is, is that politics is messy and difficult and full of compromises. And and I think that that's one of the reasons why, on some level, um, you go back and even read diaries of 200 years ago, people were disappointed in the politicians they had. I think that, to some degree, that is part of the the business. I take the point very seriously around ministers, if they haven't if they've done something incorrect and that the Prime Minister should should fire them or not. But I but I don't should, should he have fired Priti Patel? Well, ultimately are you talking about the, the ministerial the, the bullying thing, yeah. So, well ultimately she, she was found guilty. Ultimately the Prime Minister though looked at the details of that of the um the report and decided that he had taken and he, he made his judgment. And, and your judgment would be? Well to be in my in my um, to be honest, I didn't read the full report. What I read were the, simply the conclusions of it, and it appears that she clearly fell out with a lot of senior civil servants in her department. I'm not sure necessarily whether that merited a, a sacking offence, but, you know, I wasn't there. What, what about Gavin Williamson, I think who, by common consent, even among Conservatives, has, has been a pretty hopeless education secretary. You look at all the events of last year. D does incompetence not mean that you should lose your job? Incompetence does, and but... A lot of the things that have negatively impacted our children in school, going back to when we were talking about Matt Hancock at the beginning, you know, came as a result of certain people on SAGE or certain people from the Department of Health insisting that kids weren't going to be allowed in school. Now, I happen to be against that at the time, and I said it both publicly and privately, but that was the, the consequence of that then came onto the Department for Education. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't things they could have done better, but ultimately they had to deal with a very, very difficult situation and they were not in the driving seat of a lot of those decisions that impacted okay. kids in schools. Um, Gabby Hinsliff, I, I wrote at the weekend that maybe um, the, the events of the last few days have meant that we've, we've now gone past Peak Johnson. Um, I don't know how you would describe what Peak Johnson actually is, but I wonder whether... I mean, all political leaders have a peak and then they, their, their authority starts to wane. Do you think that might be happening now. It's interesting because until now, obviously, Boris Johnson has tried to hang on to people almost regardless of what they did. I mean, it, it did reach a point where he thought, what do people have to do to get fired in this cabinet short of running down Whitehall naked, shouting vote Labour? There didn't seem to be much that you couldn't do and get away with. That's an and idea for Keir Starmer to revive himself. I, I leave it there, but um, <laughs> it couldn't, couldn't be any worse than things are at the moment, and, uh, really. But, um, but I think, and, and you know, the, the fact that Matt Hancock finally resigned over something feels like, well, at least we now know what the limit is, except, of course, we don't know where Boris Johnson's limit is, because Boris Johnson said, you know, fully less than 24 hours before uh, Matt Hancock resigned, that he'd accepted the explanation and the matter was closed and that was that. Um, and then, as far as we can tell, Matt Hancock fired himself. So we still don't know um, what would have been Boris Johnson's limit and we know only that Matt Hancock decided to do um, what many people would regard as a decent thing. So does that mean, it's an odd situation to say that someone's authority has disappeared because um, they have chosen not to fire someone. You know, Normally you expect to see sort of weak Prime Minister's bullied into taking a decision. Do I think this is peak Johnson? I don't, um, I, that phrase conjures up some uh, some awkward images that I don't want to think too much about. Yeah, let's, but not, I, but, let, let's really um, not go there. Do I think it's peak Johnson? No, I mean as long as this government remains as popular as it is and more or less walking on water regardless of what it does, then um, the peak continues, doesn't it?
Okay. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Zach and Robert to be quite brief because I've just looked at the time and we're running out of it. Um, Zach? Yeah, something very rotten is at the heart of British politics. And I think ultimately, why is Matt Hancock still even an MP? When you look at the fact he was having an affair with someone and giving them £15,000 for 15 days work, at some point there's got to be a level of integrity and standard. And in British politics right now, where is the authenticity, the sincerity and the integrity? And I think all of it comes down to our broken electoral system. First past the post means that the people who you represent... You like a uh, Lib Dem. <laughs> well, I think the Lib Dems are right on this, actually, and the Green Party also, that essentially we need proportional representation. We need a fair voting system that means if you don't like your MP and you want to kick them out, you should be able to. But right now, there's far too many safe seats, which degradates the behaviour that we expect from our elected representatives. OK, Robert. I'm not sure how proportional representation does does any of that, but let's I'd be very uh, happy to explain, on. Robert. I mean, um, I, I mean, I, I, I another do love, time. Yeah, another time. Um, I, th- I mean, I, th- I think I think that's a general point. Look, you know, I, who who would be an MP now? Who would be a minister? Who I mean, Bim uh, has Thanks, done the job and has my has my has my, my thank uh, you for the utter, vote utter, of confidence. My, uh, my utter admiration for it because you know the, because you, you just the, 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 the I mean the, the stuff you you go through in that in that job you know you, you for, for for not actually that much money compared with what most people in Parliament could. Could, could be earning it. So, you know, if if you do think we are getting worse, you know, the, the quality of ministers is, is getting worse. It's probably because it's getting it's getting a worse job. I mean, you you basically just get like endless people calling you an, you know, calling you the worst possible names on social media every and every you've single day. And yourself from saying one of them just then. Well done. We like that. Right. Quick final text question from Tanya in Eastbourne. The Ministry of Defence says they're sorry about secret papers that were left at a bus stop. What's the worst thing you have ever lost? One word answers will suffice. Bim. A friend's very expensive projector that he was taking to his mother's 60th birthday. Oh, my goodness. I won't even ask how you did that. Uh, Robert. Uh, well, emotionally, uh, my job. Um, uh, but the thing I probably lose most regularly is my dignity on the dance floor uh, when I'm when I put down the handbag and, uh, <laughs> and and stop bopping to Dancing Queen. Gabby, the most annoying thing I lose on a daily basis is my mobile phone and my house keys. If I didn't have to spend half an hour looking for them every morning, then I'd be a much more productive person. I'm glad I'm not the only one, Zach. I nearly lost a fact check on Crosstalk once, but I was proved to be sort of right. Phew. <laughs> Cross question. Cross question. So I have to, Sorry, co- I have to correct you again. Now you have beaten me. Okay, I take it. 2 1. Sadiq, <laughs> Sadiq Khan did that the other day, so at least you have something in common with him. Listen, thank you all very much indeed. Gabby Hensliff, Zach Polanski, Robert Colville, and Bim Afalami. We will be back tomorrow with another edition of Cross Question. Let me just tell you who's going to be on that. And it is. Um, where is it? You'll have to wait. No, actually, no, I've got it now. Norman Lamb will be here, the former Liberal Democrat MP. He's no longer a Liberal Democrat, by the way. Ella Whelan from Spiked Online, uh, the Labour MP Khalid Mahmood, and the Conservative MP Nikki Aiken. It is two minutes past nine on LBC. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, I'm Zora Suleiman. The new health secretary says he can see no reason why England's coronavirus restrictions can't be lifted as planned on the 19th of July. Speaking.